Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Annie Kaufman. I'm the director of Marjorie Prime, and we're going to get we're going to jump right in. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to let you guys know that Marjorie Prime was a 2015 Pulitzer Prize finalist for drama, and uh, in it, playwright Jordan Harrison uh, explores the mysteries of human identity and the limits of what technology can replace. So, without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to our cast. Um, cast, will you come out on stage, please? We've got Lois Smith. <laughs> Lois Smith. Lisa Emery. Steve. All right, yes. Stephen Root. And Noah Bean. So what you're about to see is the opening scene of the play. Marjorie has recently moved in with her daughter and son-in-law since she can no longer live independently. As the lights come up, we see her with Walter, a young visitor. I feel like I have to perform around you. Well, you don't. I know. It's just me. It's just Walter. Maybe it isn't bad if I feel that way. I used to entertain a lot. I remember. You do? Marjorie, where are the dishes? The girl did them. She doesn't come till two. I did them. <laughs> you didn't. Your arthritis. I had a good day. Look. Marjorie, we both know what no dishes means. It means I haven't been eating. Even a spoonful of peanut butter. I'm not hungry. It's their fault feeding me those pills. The pills are their fault? Yes. Or your doctor? Maybe if she got Jeff. Maybe if she... She always gets the kind you have to stir, or there's an oil slick on top, and she calls that healthy. Even a spoonful? You sound like them. I sound like whoever I talk to. <coughs> Let's talk about something else. I could tell you a story. You liked that the last time. I'll have to take your word for it. I could tell you about the time we went to the movies. We went to a lot of movies. But one time, we saw my best friend's wedding. My best friend's wedding? There's a woman, Julia Roberts. For a while, it was always Julia Roberts. And she has an agreement with her best friend, her male best friend, that if they're not married by a certain age, then they'll marry each other. And she's about to remind him of the agreement, but it turns out he's already fallen in love with this nice blonde, Cameron Diaz. And so Julia Roberts spends the whole movie trying to ruin things between her friend and Cameron Diaz, which is not very sympathetic behavior for America's sweetheart. But it's all okay in the end. And she has a gay best friend who delivers one-liners. Did I like it? You said you wanted a gay best friend afterwards. Did I get one? I'm afraid I don't have that information. Why did you pick that story? Why did you pick my best friend's wedding? It's the night I proposed to you. Oh, Marjorie, the things you forget. <laughs> oh, you were trying to tell me and I wouldn't let you. That's all right. That's kind of unfortunate, isn't it? What? Julia Roberts forever etched upon our lives. What if we saw Casablanca instead? Let's say we saw Casablanca in an old theater with velvet seats, and then, on the way home, you proposed. Then, by the next time we talk, it will be true. You mean make it up? Oh, you're very serious. <laughs> you are like them, especially Tess. Our daughter. Our daughter, Tess, and her over-solicitous husband. Oh, no, that, that's not fair. I like him. 
I didn't, but now I do. Do you like me? Don't be an idiot. Don't call me an idiot. Idiot. Why do you like me if I'm an idiot? Well, there are some things you know. <laughs> what kinds of things? What? I'll get in trouble. In trouble? <laughs> For talking to you that way. In trouble with Tess. Everything gets me in trouble with her. She's the mother now. Tell me more about your mother. <laughs> you don't always understand, do you? <sighs> oh, something is a little off with the nose. I'm sorry. Or maybe my memory is wrong and you're right. You're a good Walter, though, either way. Thank you. Stay with me a while. I don't want to get you in trouble. You learn. I like that. I told you. Hmm. What else do you want to talk about? We don't have to talk. We can just sit. Sometimes I get so I'll be right here, Marjorie, whenever you need me. I have all the time in the world. Great, so I'm just gonna start out by um, asking our playwright, Jordan Harrison, uh, what inspired you to write this play? Uh, well, for the, the last couple of plays, I've been, I think, obsessed with this transition from the analog world to the digital world. It seems to me that those of us alive right now are the only humans in history who uh, are still driving our own cars, but realize that soon our cars are going to be driving us. Like, it's a strange, <laughs> amphibious thing we're doing right now. And um, in my obsession, I found uh, Brian Christian's book, The Most Human Human. Um, and Brian will talk a little more in depth about his book, but I, I'll uh, just sort of thumbnail it and say that it's to do with the Turing test, uh, which was devised by the British mathematician Alan Turing in 1950 as a kind of test of whether computers can think. And uh, in short, you put a computer and a human in another room and you ask them both questions, and then you have to decide based on their answers which one is the computer and which one is the human. Um, and uh, I was so taken with this that I originally wanted to write this play as a kind of collaboration with a computer, with a chatbot. I would type in um, the questions and the computer would respond as it would, and then you would go and see the play with two human actors and have to decide which one was written by Jordan Harrison, which one was written by a computer. Um, and, I, and what I discovered, what it was, uh, good news for humankind and bad, <laughs> bad news for my play, which is the computer could not keep up its end of the conversation yet. It, um, I would say, uh, you know, <laughs> I have, you know, I'm really angry with my mother, and it would say, tell me more about your mother, and, and like sort of just parrot things back to me, and that, um, that defeat actually became an, a useful tool in the play that, that, emerged Marjorie Prime because when the AI programs in the play reveal themselves, it's, um, I, I, I use the failures of the actual technology as a way to reveal that uh, the people that you're seeing in front of you might not be people after all. So yeah. wait, so just, has anything made it into the play? That, wh is any dialogue um, related to? I'm sorry, I didn't tell you I was going to ask you that it's, question. Yeah, it's been too long. I don't oh, okay. My, my okay. notes are, are miserable, yes. I told him what I was going to ask him, so and this is a little off script, so sorry. Okay. <laughs> all, right. Um, all right, so Brian uh, uh, is the author of The Most Human Human, um, which is basically uh, a sort of an exploration of what uh, computers can teach us about being human. Uh, and one of the things, or, the, or, or I, it feels like sort of the galvanizing experiment was um, the, the Loebner Prize right. um, that you participated in, mm -hmm. uh, which is a kind of Turing test, but sort of turned on its head a yeah. little bit. So can you tell us uh, a little bit about the Loebner Prize and sort of what your strategies uh, were? Um, Absolutely, great. yeah. Um, 
so as Jordan, I think, did a very good job explaining, you know, the Turing test is this seminal thought experiment in artificial intelligence, comes from 1950, and the idea is, you know, you attempt to discern which of these two conversations you're having is with an actual person and which is with a piece of computer software claiming to be a person. Um, Turing makes this very famous prediction in 1950 that we will reach a point in time, he said around the year 2000, where we would be deceived so often that we would just have to basically throw up our hands and, and speak of machines as thinking without expecting to be contradicted. Um, and this is one of the famous predictions of computer science that did not come true. Um, but for me, one of the really interesting things that happens is, um, and, and for many decades, this is purely a piece of philosophy. This is a pure thought experiment. Um, and then in the year 1991, uh, this, this rogue millionaire uh, light up plastic portable disco dance floor uh, <laughs> baron from New Jersey uh, by the name of Hugh Loebner uh, decides that he thinks the technology has reached a point where we should actually be holding these competitions every year because sooner or later the machines are going to win. Um, and so he modestly names this after himself the Loebner Prize <laughs> competition. Um, and my, my, my eyebrows really went up. Uh, I got interested in this in 2008. And that year, the top computer program at the Loebner Prize had managed to fool uh, three out of the 12 judges um, and was one vote short of passing the Turing test. And so, you know, the London Times runs this headline, humanity dodges a bullet. <laughs> um, and there was this sense that, you know, the following year, or if not then, then sometime shortly thereafter, would, would be this turning point year um, and so as I read this, uh, a voice in me rose up and said, you know, not on my watch. <laughs> and I phoned the organizers of the Loebner Prize and I said, I want in and I want to be part of the human defense. I want to be one of these real people in this chat room uh, fighting to attest to my own humanity um, amidst the sea of programs. To claiming. convince them that you were actually a human over a right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and one of, the, one of the really charming conceits of the Loebner Prize is uh, each judge, uh, after a, a conversation, they assign it this numerical score that basically says how confident they were that they were talking to a human being. And every year there's a computer program that gets the highest score among all the computer programs. Um, and they win this prize called the Most Human Computer Award and it's a research grant and a bronze medal with Alan Turing's face on the front and Hugh Loebner's face on the back. Um, <laughs> But what really caught my attention was, of course, every year there's also a, a real person that gets the highest plausibility score among all the real people. Um, and for this, you're awarded this very intriguing and, and bizarre prize called the Most Human Human Award. Um, and so for me, what, what started as a book about the history of artificial intelligence actually became a book about human conversation and how is it that we relate to each other? And is there, is there any meaning to this question of can you act more humanly uh, in, in some situation than in another? Does the most human human also receive the same medal or is there a different um, prize for that? Um, you receive zero US dollars oh, and um, uh, a computer printout on a, on a eight by eight and a half by eleven piece. Of Wait, paper. did you win that? And you did you win that? Yeah, you I, actually won the yeah, most I'll, human. I'll proudly claim I was the yeah. two thousand and nine most human human. Um. I'm so embarrassed. Yes. <laughs> no, because I read the book and then I in rehearsal the other day I said to Jordan I said wait. Did he win the most human human? And, and Jordan was like, Annie, yes. That's like the whole point. I was very, very embarrassed by that. Um, so, uh, Jordan, I, I, you, you sort of talked about the inception of the, of the play. Um, at the heart of it, you have a, an 85-year-old, uh, you have an 85-year-old protagonist. Mm -hmm. um, where, where did that come from? Where, where is, you know, where's right. the heart of that? There was a... I guess an intellectual inspiration and an, an emotional inspiration and they sort of intersected and became 
one play where there might have been two plays. I, around the same time I read Brian's book, um, my grandmother was in her 90s and my parents were driving an hour each day to, to care for or each way to care for her. And they, uh, they gave her a journal to sort of help keep her mind sh sharp. That was the idea behind it. And she was just so tired that she only did a single entry. And that it turned into their caretaking journal. And after she passed away, I asked them to, to share the journal with me. By then, it was actually four or five books. Um, and what was striking, first of all, was how different the person in the, in the books were was from the person who I saw at Christmas and had a glorious smile on and like how much she had um, kept me from what her daily life was actually like. Um, but the other striking thing about it was how much of uh, what they were doing for her was, was reminding her of the sort of glorious details and anecdotes of her life on a daily basis and her you know, her lovers, and um, mm. it, it was, um, it seemed to me that there was a parallel to be made between the way that when you sit down with a chatbot, you're feeding them more information in order to make them more human, and what they were doing for her, which was to keep her human and to keep right. her aware of who she was. Um, right, right, yes. Yeah. Um, I, I want to, this is sort of a two-pronged question that I, I'm hoping will sort of span the two of you. Um, First of all, it's pretty. Uh, it's it's an interesting um, exercise or challenge. I think um, you know, Marjorie Prime is uh, a, a play. It's uh, happening in uh, the medium of the theater, which is a kind of archaic art form. Um, and well, not in a bad. You know, you guys know what I mean. Um, <laughs> but there there is a uh, there's uh, there's a slight oxymoron, right? Because basically, basically, what we're trying to do in the rehearsal room. Uh, with this play is to represent computers um, with actual human beings, right? Um, and usually it seems like there's, it's the reverse that happens, that computers are actually trying to represent, you know, represent right. human beings. Um, so it's a little oxymoronish. Um, so I want to sort of talk about that in terms of um, the play and what we're doing, but also, um, there's, there's a proliferation of uh, the subject of AI in, in, in movies. I mean, we had talked about in our, in our conversation over the phone, uh, her, yep. for instance, in Ex Machina. Um, and so I'm sort of interested in, in how the mediums are dealing with it and, and what, we're, what sort of trends we're seeing uh, um, in art dealing with AI. So uh, I'm gonna, Whoever talks first. <laughs> um, That's a couple of very different questions. I was asking. Are, but I feel like we can yeah. bridge them somehow. Yes, definitely. I, I was asking Brian the other day, like what it says about us that all these narratives about AI and Hollywood, and I suppose in my play, posit that the humans fall in love instantly with the AI <laughs> figures. Like, what? I mean, are we? Um, what does that mean? Why they're just, they're just instantly <laughs> superior to right. any human rival. Right. <laughs> Chabot yeah. are instantly, uh, instant, instantly uh, superior. Well, I mean, in her, certainly, there's this right. notion that, that, you know, Samantha has just ruined him for any, like, human Human right? being. <laughs> but we were talking about her and sort of mm -hmm. the, the prolifer, you know, sort of what that is to fall in love with a computer um, and what it is that we as human beings are striving for actually in this age of, um, tech, of advancing, uh, advancements in technology. Yeah. You know, I mean, what we expect from or want from them. Yeah, I, I, certainly I feel like there's this macro, uh, I mean, I, I probably know more about like the history of science in the 20th century than the history of science fiction in the 20th century, but I do think there's this very macro trend. You know, you go back to, um, you know, something like the Jetsons, where it's like, here's a robot that's gonna do your dishes and it's gonna be so great. Um, and now, like, science fiction is both more ambitious and so much grimmer, which is like, you know, here's this AI that's gonna have phone sex with you and it's gonna ruin your life. <laughs> you know, it's gonna destroy society. Um, <laughs> that, like, we've just come so far in terms right, of, like, right. what the narrative portrayal is. Like, but yeah. do you think with the advancement of technology that human beings are desiring more from uh, computers, you know, rather than just tasks that we're actually asking for emotional um, sustenance? I mean, this is really, this goes back to the, the very inception of, of the very first chatbot program that was ever written, which was in 1968 by an MIT professor named Joseph Weizenbaum. 
um, he creates this little script basically as a, as a parody, uh, as, a, as a manner of ridicule for what he sees as um, uh, this kind of absurd trend in, in psychotherapy of this kind of Rogerian non-directive therapy where the therapist just sort of redirects your questions or reflects your statements back to you and allows you to kind of like achieve some sort of personal growth more or less on your own. Um, he creates this script that basically operates like a kind of Mad Libs, um, which he calls it template matching. It basically looks for keywords in anything you say and then just redirects the conversation based on that keyword. So, I mean, the, the moment in the script of tell me about your mother is for anyone who studies chatbots, you know, this wonderful allusion to, you know, the, the very types of things that Eliza, which was the name of this program, would say. You know, you'd, you'd say, I'm feeling sad, and it would say, you're feeling sad, tell me more. Right. You're like, well, my <laughs> mother's mad like? at me. <laughs> tell me more about your mother. And the amazing thing is that this worked for people. I mean, Eliza, yeah, exactly. people were um, smitten with her. They wanted, it felt like therapy. It felt like someone was listening. Um, and I think even Carl Sagan predicted that it would be the way that therapists could, could manage to have 10,000 different clients at the same time is by like farming them out yeah. to their AI program. It really does yeah. sound um, like my therapist. You know, it really does. It's actually like, I mean, later in the, in the evening, we'll talk about how human beings are sort of veering towards uh, computers. Now, com computers are actually veering towards human beings and where the crossover is. But already, I can tell that my therapist is... Um, wouldn't be able to compete with an AI <laughs> That's right. Yeah. It would not win the most um, human human. Just to loop back to yeah. the first part of your question, which was... Um, putting, having humans playing computers on stage. I, I guess um, something that maybe I'm a little bit infamous for at this point is plays with enormous production demands, and I've subjected Annie Kaufman to several of them, and um, our last play together had 32 scenes and many trap doors and quick mm -hmm. changes, and the, it just moved like a Broadway show. So I liked the thought of giving both of us a break and writing a play bound to a single room where the, <laughs> where the special effect is essentially actors. <laughs> um, and, and we're basically like putting um, the uncanny on stage is how, how I think of it. They're familiar, when they're playing primes, they're familiar and unfamiliar. They're uh, seductive and repellent <laughs> at the same time. Um, and I think even if we had the sort of budget to create Princess Leia digital projections of them, that wouldn't be the right choice because there's, it, would, it would never quite be your loved one sitting there in front of you and that's the like the amazing thing that a human actor can do is you can fool yourself into thinking that this prime as they're called is is your is your mother or your husband or whoever yeah. it's true it's really kind of tricky in the room i mean and these guys can attest to it you're in the dark though so you can't talk <laughs> um, <laughs> is sort of how to direct the primes, you know? Yeah. Uh, we keep going back and forth. I mean, basically, uh, we've struggled with the idea how of like... How human, how... Yeah, sort of like, you know, as an actor, uh, you know, you think, oh, I call back, oh, I remember in my childhood, uh, this and this happened, and that will fuel my performance. But you can't be like, well, when I was a computer, <laughs> I remember, <laughs> you know, so we're, we're actually kind of... Uh, we're, we're, we're trying, uh, part of the rehearsal process is trying to figure out how to talk about um, how to develop uh, the characters as, as computers. And I think the closest thing that we've gotten to is basically um, if these computers are being um, filled up with information to sort of um, reflect back that, that you know, we, we, we talk about them a lot as um, children or, or, or the word innocence um, sort of comes, comes mm. up because it's, uh, uh, and so, and so it's, it's this sort of negotiation uh, a bit about how to um, articulate that. You know, and one of the questions I was going to ask you, uh, Brian, is um, I don't, you know, whatever your familiarity with the play is so far, um, the primes that we have depicted, do they? How close are they, or, or the sort of the services that they provide, and the kinds of um, comfort or w w roles that they play? Is there something that already exists that's that's like it? Is it mm. something that will, will happen? In, do, you, do you predict that it'll happen in the future? Are we, or neither, you know? I mean, it's interesting because, you know, I think one of, one of the big things that people ask about 
chatbot technology is from a commercial perspective, you know, it's going to cost inevitably billions of dollars to develop like full scale conversational AI. And the question is like, what's the business case for doing that? Um, you know, there's a reason to build an AI that guides a missile, or there's a reason to build an AI that helps you like change your credit card number or something like that if you need to. Um, but what's the business case for an AI that just keeps you company, um, that just talks to you and hangs out? Um, and the answer that I've heard most frequently when I've talked to these technologists is um, the first thing that comes, you know, out of their mouth is uh, companions for the elderly. Um, and so that, that is absolutely like the number one business case. Um, and, you know, to me that's <laughs> like, <laughs> it's very poignant. Um, and, you know, there, there are these interesting inroads to that. You know, there's a company in Japan that makes these um, kind of robotic f stuffed seals um, that you pet and they make noises and they make you feel like you have a pet even if you can't quite take care of a real pet. Um, and the, the idea is to basically like scale that up to the level of you know a real companion, um, but I, you know of, of course as a you know looking critically at the culture you have to ask yourself like is pouring billions of dollars into developing you know full conversational AI the correct way of addressing you know this like social problem that people feel lonely or are there perhaps other <laughs> Superior ways of addressing that, <laughs> like friends. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It was something that I was reading in, in your book is the, the idea of domain or the yeah. expert, and because in the play um, there are several pl uh, primes, you have to come see it to um, to fully uh, experience it, obviously. But they do have I the way that again that we've been sort of talking about it in rehearsal is. A certain prime is there for a certain reason. Is providing a certain kind of emotional support for um, a living person. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I was sort of interested in reading about this idea of domain and what's outside of the domain. And, and do you know what I'm saying? Oh yeah, the, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, in the so in the early '90s, um, chatbot technology was considered still in its infancy enough that they. Uh, the organizers of the Loebner Prize felt the need to basically handicap, uh, assign some kind of handicap that would help the, the chatbots. And so what they did was they constrained every conversation that the human judges were having in, in those competitions to some kind of predefined topic that might be, you know, Shakespeare's plays or, you know, the Boston Bruins or things like this. Um, but they quickly came into this, uh, you know, philosophical problem of like the guy at the hockey computer wanted to talk about like the Cold War tensions underneath the USA, USSR, you know, 1980 Olympic match. And the, you know, they, they called this arbiter over and, and they were like, well, is that still a hockey question or, or is this now a politics question? <laughs> um, and so one of the things that like very immediately emerges is just, um, you know, humans don't work that way. You don't assign some domain and say like, this is going to parameterize, you know, all the interaction that's possible, and you simply can't exceed that. Right. It just doesn't and work that way. In fact, one of the famous cases of a human not passing for a human was a Shakespeare expert who knew just too much about it. Yeah. No, none of the judges could believe that it wasn't a computer because, like, this is one of my favorite so anecdotes. Yeah, she was too much of a domain expert. Yeah. yeah. Um, there was a woman in the '90s who was in the Shakespeare terminal, and and her strategy to to sort of vie for the most human human title of that year was, you know, no computer could possibly understand the profound depths of human literature. Therefore, whatever I'm asked, I will just respond with these like essay length, you know, treatises on like the meaning of Othello. Um, and the judges, I think unanimously voted this woman a computer. And the, and the consensus was like, no one knows that much about Shakespeare. <laughs> Not possible. That's okay, a great uh, lead Let's into our right next now. excerpt. Um, so this is excerpt number two. Um, this is gonna be a little later the same day as the first excerpt that you, s that you s saw. Marjorie's daughter Tess and her son-in-law John arrive home after grocery shopping. Marjorie is asleep in another room. I think 
think it's encouraging that she's keeping up with technology. You know, my mother would never. I mean, she, she still had an iPod. <laughs> So to still be, you know, engaged. Engaged or pacified. Does it bother you that she's talking to a computer or that it's a computer pretending to be your dad? It bothers me that you're helping it pretend to be my dad or some weird fountain of youth version of him. That's how she remembers Both him. of you are helping it. Not helping, that's just how it works. The more you talk, the more it absorbs. Until we become unnecessary, isn't that how it goes? In science fiction. Science fiction is here, Jonathan. Every day is science fiction. We buy these things that already know our moods and what we want for lunch, even though we don't know ourselves. And we listen to them. We do what we're told. Or in this case, we tell them our deepest secrets, even though we have no earthly idea how they work. We treat them like our loved ones. Are you jealous? What? <laughs> no, of the prime. You are. Am I supposed to not notice that she's being nicer to that thing than to me? It's your father she's being nice it to. It is not my father. Yeah, it's true. She could be a little more openly appreciative sometimes. <laughs> That's not but, you what know, I'm you saying. can't just sit around waiting for a gratitude dance. I don't need a dance. She took care of you. It's your turn to take care of her. Oh, she took care of me. Of course. You weren't there. <sighs> Think how hard. Move out of a house you've been in for what, 40 years? 50 years. years. And give up your autonomy. I know, boot. I know. John Good, test bad. Right, maybe if you told it a few things, it would be a way to connect with her indirectly. What would I tell it? Well, things your father would know, things you want her to remember. Then when she talks to it, she'll remember she had an interesting life. She had all these suitors lined up for she her. She only needed one. <laughs> the cool part is it can look stuff up. It can talk to other primes <sighs> for practice. It's, it's like a child learning to talk, only it does it so quickly. That's how we think we're talking to a human, because it listens so well. It even studies our imperfections to see that we're more real. It can use non sequiturs. It, it can, you know, misplace modifiers. It can run out of steam when it's listing things. <sighs> it's company. It's no different than what we do for her, only it can be there all the time. Really? It's no different from us. Look, I can already see the change in her. Just to have eight or nine stories to hold on to, new things are already coming to the surface. New things. The other day, she said, out of nowhere, she said, why did they have to tease him so much? You think it was Damien? What did you say? Nothing. She was drifting in and out. I thought she'd forgotten. Guess I sort of hoped. Yeah, but we have to remind her, right? Do we? Oh, to have a, a, a little peace. I mean, that was her life for so many years. Partly it was the way it happened. She blamed herself. Oh, she blamed everyone, anyone who made him feel not normal. Was he normal? He was different. I, mean, I knew that and I was 10. I think it was always with her. We thought she gave his stuff away, but dad found it all in a closet behind the Christmas ornaments out of sight, but still with her. So maybe he'll still be with her even when she doesn't know our names anymore. God, I don't know how memory works. I think of it like, uh, like sedimentary layers in the brain, but I'm sure that's wrong. We should get a book. I like sedimentary layers. It means it's all still there. Uh, it doesn't always seem that way. No. I think we should remind her to... And I think we should not, John, and she's You'd my mom. You'd rather just let everything slip She's away. my mom, John! How much does she have to forget before she's not your mom anymore? I'm sorry. No, that was. I'm sorry. You're right. She's just gotten so old. She's just so old. And we're old. She's... She's beyond. Mom, you're up. You want tea? Yes, please. 
I stocked you up with some Marie calendars. I have a feeling it won't compare to your lobster pot pie. I saw you ate some peanut butter. I thought you'd like that. I'm very predictable, yes. Were you sleeping a while? I don't know. I was watching the girl on TV, the strident one, and then just out. Oh, that's how it should happen when it happens. Mom! Uh, don't be morbid. Uh, I know. Let's all pretend we live forever. You've got your color back, Margie. Oh, thank you, John. It's always nice to be lied to. You two get along so well now. Oh, I like him more now that he cut off his beard. <laughs> that was 30 years ago. It wasn't. It was. And you stopped worrying about impressing me. That helped. Well, you gave up on being impressed. Yes, that's true. I remember waking up on a bridge with a lot of people around. Why were you sleeping on a bridge? Maybe Walter would remember. We could ask Walter. Dad is dead, Mom. I know that. He's been dead for 10 years. Yes. I mean the other Walter, Walter Prime. I'm not that far gone. Great, so um, in this excerpt, Tess says, uh, science fiction is here, Jonathan. Uh, the play takes place 50 years in the future-ish. I don't want to get too specific about that. <laughs> um, but can we argue that that's happening right now, that the future is now, is here? Yes. <laughs> end of, <laughs> that's the end, yeah. And how so? Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the one of the famous quips that AI people make is that AI has been 20 years away for 50 years, <laughs> um, and and yet, I mean, it it is very much the case that uh, you know when when leading computer scientists are polled and are asked at what point will AI, you know, full blown human level or beyond AI exist. Uh, when will that happen? Uh, the the answer is unanimously in the 21st century. At, at some point, it, we don't know which decade, but we know right. which century, and it's this one. Um, and you know, I think there there is a sense in which, like, once once you tr reach that point, um, you you almost kind of like re restart history. I mean, it's like as Jordan is saying, like we're we're actually living in I think this very interesting generation that like straddles that. I'll tell you what I think of when I when she gets to that passage every time. It's um, in 1998, I worked at Amazon.com when it was in two buildings in Seattle and had never turned a profit. And I uh, probably should have stayed there rather than going back to school. I'd be a wealthier man. Um, and there was a kind of company-wide meeting and Jeff Bezos, the CEO, was projected on a giant screen with no sort of irony about the fact that he looked like Orwell. <laughs> um, and he was telling us about this amazing new initiative that Amazon was starting to, um, to keep track of what everyone purchased and also to keep track of personal relationships and birthdays so that when your Aunt Frida's birthday came up, it could suggest to you that she might like the new Barbara Kingsolver novel. So, well, yeah. yeah, you yeah. get it. Um, and, uh, <coughs> and I just remember so vividly how terrifying that was to me that it would know what I wanted to read and it would tell other people. And now it is such a normal part of our lives, such a given. Um, it's a given, it's so, annoying, right? Yes. But it's, it's, it is, it's sort of an annoyance when you're looking up something and then there's a banner across right. here, you know, that knows your taste. So it's like, go see this show at this theater because I know I'm a theater person. Right, or I right. remember going to Minority Report not so very long ago, starring mm -hmm. Lois Smith, by the way. And <laughs> Tom Cruise would be walking through like a spacey building and 
pop-up ads would materialize saying, hello, Mr. Cruz, wouldn't you like this new Gap sweatshirt? And that seemed like the future, and now we live in that personalized marketing. Um, so I guess, uh, I, I, I guess I think that my power to predict the future it will be outrun always by how quickly the future gets here. Like, it almost feels like the the time it takes to get a play on stage is slower than the, <laughs> the progress of, of human technology, yeah. And you were also talking about uh, sort of how chat, how so, sort of you're always, there's a Turing test that happens every day when people, when you yeah. go into your email. Yeah, I mean, I think, this I think is probably the thing that would have most shocked Alan Turing himself, who otherwise was just insanely prescient in his in his 1950 paper, he basically says, these are the possible objections one can make to AI, and he, and he preemptively writes out basically the entire debate that's going to happen for the next 50 years. Um, it's all actually already contained in the, in the first paper. But I think what he would have been really shocked by had he lived into the 21st century um, is the fact that, uh, you know, it, we have this routine experience where you get an email and it says, you know, from Jordan, um, check out these new like Viagra and Cialis dis discounts. <laughs> They're um, awesome, Brian. And yeah, we're, we're going to talk after the show. But um, uh, you know, there's this there's this reaction that that all of us un I think unanimously have, which is not to say like you might want to just run that by your doctor or you know see if that's on the up and up. Instead, right. we we reply like I think you, you should change your password. You know, so, <laughs> um, and so th I mean, this for me is this very profound thing, which is that. Um, the very act of reading an email or a text message or a Facebook message or any of these things now constitutes a Turing test. We, we read absolutely every communication with our guards up saying, does this sound like the kind of thing that Jordan would say because it might not really be Jordan? Um, and all I have to go on is the diction and the syntactical choices that are, are in evidence. Um, and it's interesting to hear you, like yeah. now I, I realize, I think about the way I write emails and I say, hi darling, with an apostrophe, yeah. and I would never say that in, in person to person contact in a million years. So you is don't there have to. the yeah. pressure to be folksier, to like infuse that email with some of your soul? Yeah, know? I mean, so I, I very much feel that like we, we are now under pressure to, to perform ourselves in, right. in written communication. Um, yeah, th this this sort of high darling is like on the one hand just trying to you know this this charming gesture, but on the other hand it's it's actually part of how you're authenticating the message yes. to the other person, yeah. and you know if you want them to click a link, uh, they'll trust the link more if you've said something you know that identifies mm -hmm. you as you. Jor yeah, yeah, <laughs> Jordan esque. Yeah, like. Um, I just want to I, I want to sort of talk about I mean you know I think. Uh, some of the movies that we're seeing and the books that we read and science fiction in general uh, in terms of the way it's um, represented in art feels like um, it's hard, we're hard pressed I think to find evidence of um, something other than doomsday that somehow technology is sort of you know gonna run amok and we're all gonna be destroyed mm -hmm. and something I find, uh, find really um, Unique and kind of one of the things that really attracted to me, me to the, this play was the um, actually the kind of utopian uh, idea of technology that, that happens in the play. That it's actually a po there's a positive spin. I mean, again, you'll have to come see it to see what I'm talking about. But um, do you is there ever what is that about? And 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 do we know? Are there other examples of? Um, art that represents the future or technology in positive ways and if so or, or, or what is it that we're what is positive about technology what is what you know what is uh, what can the future hold that's not just doom and gloom I, I feel like there are kind of two things in particular to be really optimistic about when it comes to thinking about AI and, and chatbot technology one theoretical thing and one practical thing um, the theoretical thing is that, you know, one of the oldest questions in philosophy is what makes human intelligence unique and distinct and special? Um, you know, this goes all the way back through Descartes to Aristotle. And one of, the, one of the means that humans have had for answering this question is to define ourselves against a backdrop of um, how we differ from animals specifically. 
Um, and so when you ask the question that way, you get answers like, well, we're capable of, you know, algebra, you know, logical deduction, uh, we can play chess, we can do, you know, manipulate these highly <laughs> formal, yeah, or so, not. so different degrees. Um, <clears throat> and I think it's this great irony that, you know, precisely these kind of left brain, rigorous, formal skills are the very things that computers first prove themselves superior to humans doing, you know, mathematics, chess, et cetera. Um, and now, for the first time in 2,500 years, we have a different standard of comparison when we ask this question of what makes humans distinct and special, uh, we now mostly are saying what makes us different than machines, not what makes us different than animals. Um, and in fact, it's precisely these sorts of perceptual, uh, perceptual intelligence, you know, how do you recognize a face, how do you recognize, you know, differentiate friend or foe, manipulate it, you know, you, you move your body through space and not crash into things. Um, these turn out to actually be more cognitively sophisticated in many cases than, you know, calculus. Um, or, the, or the things we, we think of as being hard to do, uh, precisely because we're so good at them. And so I, I feel that AI has paradoxically really vindicated um, animal intelligence and, and those aspects of, of life that have basically been kind of swept under the rug by philosophers for, you know, two millennia. So that, that's something for me to feel good about. And the other, the practical thing is just that, you know, the Turing test <clears throat> aims at a kind of scientific objectivity. You know, there's this notion of, um, in a lot of these AI competitions, once the machines win ever, then you, we should just stop holding it. You know, that was the case with Kasparov and Deep Blue. And, um, and I think the Turing test is emphatically not like that because it's being measured against this um, kind of moving goalpost, which is right. humans' ability to relate to one another and, and the sort of the standard of human conversation. And so, if anything, um, you know, I have this kind of intensely hopeful view that living in a world after the Turing test has first been passed, um, our, our response out of necessity will be to kind of raise, raise the level of, of human communication. I like the thought that it's not just the Brian Christians, the human competitors in the test that can become more human, it's the judges who can be better at identifying fellow humans. Yeah, um, yeah we're all sort of in this together, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I, just on the, um, the thought of the end of the play being, uh, I don't know if it's utopian, but optimistic. I know, I, yeah. I couldn't um, think of another word. It's not utopian, but yeah, no, it's... I, um, but I, uh, Alex Garland, who directed Ex Machina, uh, had an op-ed in the New York Times this past summer where he was basically talking about um, uh, S Stephen Hawking and Steve Wozniak and several great thinkers of their generation were saying that AI uh, is, is the apocalypse, essentially, and it will destroy us more surely than any nuclear bomb. And he was sort of putting a different spin on it, not that AI will replace us and make us unnecessary, but that it will be what is remembered of us. And that is <laughs> what, that feels very much to me like the end of the play. And I, I, I suppose um, we shouldn't talk too much about a thing they don't get to see, but it's, um, it, uh, when you write a play, there's a kind of responsibility that, to not judge your characters or to dislike your characters, or at least it tends to turn out better if you try to give, have a sort of neutrality and love for your characters, and that's how it felt about the technology, that I would just write a kind of dead play if it was just meant to take down AI and show that it's not capable of being human. I, I tried to be um, ambivalent. I am ambivalent. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's great. I mean, I think that there's sort of, um, I mean, one of the, I'm thinking about sort of how, how technology can actually achieve a kind of spirituality, mm -hmm. you know? And I had recently gone to a, a, another play, um, a musical, um, where it was revealed that the idea of, um, that, the, that the word future actually at some point meant afterlife. And for me, I think it's what you're saying, is there, is there um, that Alex Garland is saying as well, is there a way that the technology can um, preserve us um, beyond uh, beyond our um, 
you know, there's a new our organism dying. Right. There's a new organization called Eternomy that a Russian billionaire, I believe, started, and it, the idea is that it calls our social media oh, right. actions over Terrifying. an entire lifetime and turns it into a kind of glowing avatar of us, a portrait in our in our social Which media. Which really actions. screws so, those of us who are not on right. Facebook so, so or we'll, we'll, we're Instagram. Just dead, basically, we're basically yeah. We, there's no legacy. Right. Oh, yeah. Well. Um, I think we might be uh, ready for our, our final excerpt. Uh, thank you all for coming, and uh, I, there's going to be a reception uh, out somewhere out there, and we rotunda. hope to see you out there in the rotunda. We hope to see you there, um, and I'm just going to prepare you for our third excerpt. Um, this is several months later, and uh, Tess and her mother are talking in the living room. That's a good sweater on you. Thank you. You picked it out for me, remember? <laughs> Three Christmases ago. Three years isn't a long time, not for me. Remember the time we took Tony to the beach? Of course I do. She was so happy, but we were finding sand in her fur for weeks. She was a good dog. <laughs> John wants to get a dog. Oh? He wants a fetch the stick kind of dog, but I was thinking a Shiba Inu. What's a Shiba Inu? They're like the national dog in Japan. Everyone has one. They're like friendly little foxes. Very clean, very quiet, very shy. Well, what do you expect? You mean... It's Japan. Mom, that is so... It is not racist. It's a compliment. <laughs> Your poor old mother was born in the 20th century. You'll have to give her time to catch up. Yeah, I think if you wanted to catch up, you'd have caught up by now. 1977? It sounds like the Middle Ages, doesn't it? <laughs> the problem with the dog is we want to travel, and who would take care of it? I would. <laughs> I wish that were possible. John wants to go to Spain, but I've already been twice. I want to see Madagascar. I'll remember that fact about you and John. Really? I'll remember that fact, really? I said something wrong. I'm no, sorry. No, it's, it's not your fault. Just not very good at this. Good at? Pretending that you are, because sometimes you are so good, you're so her, like that bit with the subtle racism. It makes it harder when something stumps you. Try to be patient with me. I wish I could give you a spoonful of peanut butter. That would help. <laughs> you could smile less, too. That would be more her. You, more you. Thank you for observing that rule. Pronouns are powerful things. Why don't you tell me more about myself? <laughs> no, I don't know where to start. I don't smile much, you said. Not with your mouth open. Towards the end, you were embarrassed about your teeth. I'm vain. A little. That's helpful. You had a bit of a temper. I sound wonderful. <laughs> Do I have other children besides you? Just me. What a lot of pressure for you. Did I say something wrong again? No, you didn't. You were saying just you. Yeah, and you have three grandchildren, all grown, well-ish. What did they do? Micah is a chef. Mitchell does financial something, raping and pillaging. I gave up trying to understand. <laughs> raping and pillaging. Oh, I didn't mean he really. That was just a bad joke. <laughs> Raina is the youngest. She's 23. She's in a band. That's a job? No, it is not. <laughs> Who do I like the most? That was very Marjorie. Well? Micah is the best about keeping in touch. He's conscientious. Mitchell, not so much. But he makes up for it with charisma. But I think you like Drena the most. She's musical like me. Mm, if you can call it music. I went to one of her concerts. She was playing a bag of broken glass. Do they visit? Raina doesn't talk to me. 
her therapist said it would be better for now. Someone I have never met has advised my daughter not to talk to me. So she calls John and he fills me in. It's humiliating. She's 23. She'll work through it, give her time. That sounds more like John. Oh yes, you haven't done telling me what I'm like. Well, you would never accept the silent treatment from your daughter. Oh, boy. You thought women should be women, that they should be feminine. Naturally. One time we passed a girl in the street with short hair, and you asked her if she was in the Navy. <laughs> I'm rude, too. Mm -hmm. Just direct. You were very good with flowers, a wizard with flowers. But you didn't... Don't. Sorry. You, d you don't like to wear strong scents. You said fabric softener was all the perfume anyone needed. God, this isn't important. It's all important. You and Dad fought, but you loved each other. Neither of you seem to be more in love than the other, which is always lucky. Maybe he, he loved you a little more. Towards the end, we sometimes had to remind you he was dead. Sometimes every day, where's Walter? You'd make us kill him all over again. And then after we reminded you, you would say, how nice that I could love somebody. And I wasn't sure that you really felt that at peace, but it was a nice way of putting it. How nice that I could love somebody. It's funny. It's not so different. What? This, from what we used to do for you the last year or two. We'd sit there and tell you what you were like. Near the end, you were so almost guilty to still be here. You felt so useless. And I wondered if you could have pushed a button, if you could have just pressed off, would you have stuck around the last couple of years? I guess it's a good thing we don't have that button. Nobody would last very long. What else? You got along with animals. Tony liked you, the best of all of us. Well, second best. Second best. Who did she like better? You, we should save that for another day. That's a whole other story. I have all the time in the world. Why are you the Marjorie for me? I don't understand. Why is this the way I want to remember her? Me? Yes, God, sorry. You, you think I'd see you the way you were when I was a girl, but no. I wish I could tell you, sweetheart. No. You wouldn't say, sweetheart. How am I with you? You haven't said much about me and you. Are we close? You weren't a bad mom. But we didn't tell each other things, secret things, not really. Some people have a point where their parents stop being their parents to them. You start talking as one adult to another. Not sure we ever had that. Maybe that's why I'm your Marjorie. I don't understand. Maybe I'm the Marjorie you still have things to say to. John will be back soon. He's just out getting a Japanese maple for the driveway. Is it quiet and shy? That's a joke like the Shiba Inu. I got it. <laughs> the Shiba Inu sounds nice, but so does the Kali. 
Excuse me? I said, collies are nice dogs, too. Does John know we're talking? Well, yes. How? He saw in the program history. I knew I didn't tell you about the collie. God, he couldn't resist campaigning, even to you. <laughs> Don't be angry with John. He was so happy to see that we're talking. Did he program you to say that? There's no programming, just talking exactly what we've been doing. He, he wanted to help me be more real, to help you. You've been so down. Pity from a computer. <laughs> that feels... Do you have emotions, Marjorie, or do you just remember ours? Do you feel anything? I like to know more. Why? It makes me better. Better? More human. So in other words, you like to be more human. Yes, I think that's right. What are humans like? Unpredictable. Really? I think we are pretty predictable, or at least I feel predictable. I see. What? You want to be more human, too. <laughs> <laughs>